Thanks for waiting. I hope you're excited. Thank you for responding to my announcement earlier. I just wanted to let everybody know ahead of time that something extraordinary was coming. And so without further ado, this is so exciting. This starts out with this article that was just in Adam Eliyahu Berkowitz wrote it. It is in Israel365news.com. And we already know that the Messiah came and that the star appeared and the kings from the east came to worship the Messiah. And this article is based on a Jewish interpretation. So it's going to be a little bit different. But listen, scientists expect Star of Jacob to appear this month. And then it gives a scripture. What I see for them is not yet. What I behold will not be soon. A star rises from or Jacob. A scepter comes forth from Israel. It smashes the brow of Moab, the foundation of all children of Sheth. That is Numbers 24, verse 17. Then it says, scientists predict that a nova um, in the star system called T. Coroni Borealis, or TCRB, will be visible to people on Earth in the next month. TCRB will appear 1,500 times brighter than usual, making it the 50th brightest star in the night sky. This nova may just be the star of Jacob, Balaam described as presaging the appearance of the Messiah. A nova is the temporary brightening of a star before it fades again, not to be confused with a supernova that occurs when a massive star explodes at the end of its life. TCRB is a binary star system made up of a red giant and a white dwarf. They orbit each other every 228 days at about half the distance between Earth and the Sun. In this case, the Earth-sized white dwarf is slowly stripping hydrogen away from the ancient red giant. Once enough hydrogen accumulates on the white dwarf, the growing pressure and heat trigger a thermonuclear blast visible from Earth. As TCRB is 2,630 light years from Earth, light from the binary system requires 2,630 years to arrive at Earth. The nova we will see occurred over 2,000 years ago, but its light will reach us next month. TCRB is one of 10 recurrent novas recorded that erupt on time scales of less than a century. On average, TCRB undergoes a nova process once every 80 years. TCRB was first observed in the fall of 1217 by Burkhardt, abbot of Erzberg, Germany, who recorded a faint star that for a time shone with great light. Observations during its past two novae in 1866 and 1946 showed that TCRB became slightly brighter about 10 years before the nova was visible from the Earth. After brightening, the light from TCRB briefly dimmed indicating an eruption before September of 2024. Astronomers predict that the next NOVA event will occur between February and September. Scientists are excited as this will be the first outburst since modern spectroscopic observations have been available. During the next NOVA event, TCRB, also known as the Blaze Star, is expected to jump to second magnitude, making it similar in brightness to the North Star Polaris. It could be visible to the naked eye for several days and potentially visible uh, for over a week through binoculars before dimming and returning to obscurity. The next nova for TCRB is not expected for another 80 years, making this a potential once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event. Ephraim Palvanov, a teacher and author, writes the blog Maim, acronym, it's named for the little-known Jewish ritual of washing the fingers after a meal. Like the eponymous mitzvah, the blog covers Jewish subjects that are misunderstood or not normally discussed. 
Star of Jacob will appear on Friday, September 27th. The current wars in Ukraine and Israel, as consistent with end-of-days predictions recorded in classical Jewish literature. Polvanov emphasized that he was not making a prediction or a prophecy, but was describing an astronomical event as described in Jewish literature. We know that probably one of the oldest prophecies and traditions about the Messiah comes from Balaam, a Gentile prophet who came to curse Israel but couldn't curse them, he said. Instead, he gives a prophecy that actually says, I will tell you what will happen at the end of days. It's one of the few places that the Torah uses the expression end of days. Balaam says that he is looking far into the future, and he prophesies that a star will emerge from Jacob. Of course, Christians adopted this in the nativity scene and the star of Bethlehem. No, it was the fulfillment of the prophecy. This verse was interpreted by Rabbi Moses ben Maimon, known as Maimonides, and by the acronym Rambam, the foremost Torah authority of the 12th century. In his book, Mishnah Torah, the Rambam uses this verse about a star appearing as proof that the Messiah will come one day. According to the Rambam, the Messiah will come from Jacob, more specifically from the tribe of Judah. Polvanov explained that the prophecy of the star of Jacob was applied to Simon bar Kokhba. And, of course, they were wrong. He was a false messiah. He was the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt of 132 AD, whose adopted name, Bar Kokhba, meant son of a star in Aramaic. The failure of the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which was considered a political messiah, had a large impact on the interpretation of the Star of Jacob. The failure of the revolt led the sages to de-emphasize the eschatology of the Star of Jacob, and that led to a preference for the explanation that the Star of Jacob was no longer relevant since it was described as already happening in the time of King David. There was always, even in ancient times, an association of the Messiah or a potential Mashiach with the Star of Jacob. Balaam even prophesied that this star will mark the end of Amalek. He saw Amalek, and taking up his theme, he said, A leading nation is Amalek, but its fate is to perish forever. The Zohar that they read in 2.12b goes into detail describing the Star of Jacob. And it is taught that in the future, the Holy One, blessed be He, will rebuild Jerusalem and reveal one firm star glowing with 70 pillars of fire and with 70 sparks flashing from it in the middle of the firmament. And they will be reigned over by 70 other stars. And they will glow and burn for 70 days. And the star will be seen on the sixth day, on the 25th day of the sixth month. It will be gathered on the seventh day at the end of 70 days. On the first day, it will be seen in the city of Rome. On that same day, three high structures of that city Rome will fall and a great edifice will fall. The ruler of that city will die and then the star will spread out to be seen in the rest of the world. The date described in the Zohar as the day on which the star will appear corresponds to the Hebrew date, the 25th of Elul. The Zohar specifies that this date will fall on a Friday, and this year the 25th of Elul falls on the 28th of September of 2024. In that time, great wars will stir all around the four corners of the world and no faith will be found among its people, the Zohar continues. In the middle of the world, when the star will shine in the middle of the firmament, a great king will arise and rule the world and his spirit will gain pride over all kings and he will awaken a war between both sides and he will become strong against them. On the day that the star will be hidden, the Holy Land will tremble 45 miles around the place of the Holy Temple, revealing an underground cave. And from this cave will come out a blazing fire to burn the world. And from this cave, a great branch will grow out. And Jesus is the branch. And it will rule over the whole world. And to it will be given the kingdom. The holy beings will gather to it. And then Messiah will be revealed to the entire world.
The Zohar then describes what the world will be like in that pre-Messianic era. The world at that time that Messiah will be revealed will have been experiencing trouble after trouble, and the haters of Israel will grow stronger, and then the spirit of the Messiah will be aroused against them, and the evil Edom will be destroyed. The entire land of Seir will be destroyed by fire. And this is what we have been experiencing, he said. One crisis coming right after another. The pandemic leading into hyperinflation, leading into the Ukraine war, leading into the war in Israel, and the war with the Houthis. And just as Zohar predicts, the haters of Israel are increasing, he said. Anti-Semitism is reaching levels it hasn't reached since the Holocaust. There are even reports that Chinese social media is full of anti-Semitism and there are no Jews in China. This type of Jew hatred doesn't make sense. So you guys, the star of Jacob that, you know, this is different than when Jesus was born. And whether this is a sign or not a sign, I just want you to hear what I've researched and come up with that is so incredible. This just blew me away. Okay, the 25th of Elul is when this star of Jacob is going to appear. And it's on September 28th. The 25th of Elul is on September 28th. Some traditions celebrate this day as the first day of creation, when God created existence, time, matter, and darkness. Some ways to celebrate include immersing oneself in a mikvah, a ritual bath, eating meals with bread and meat during the day and at night, saying blessings over food with great intention, eating sweet things, giving a lot of charity, lighting five candles at night, reading verses from the Torah about the first day of creation, chanting the letters about the Hebrew alphabet 27 times. Okay, in the last two videos, I talked about the true meaning of the parable of the 10 virgins. The five wise ones had the oil in their lamps and their lights were lit. Their candles were lit. The five wise virgins. The foolish ones didn't have enough oil in their lamps and their light was going out. And I was telling you that the light of the lamp went out in the temple after um, Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. The holy menorah would never light again. Their lamp was going out because menorah is the Hebrew word for lamp. Okay, so this just stuns me to pieces. Listen to this. On the 25th of Elul, some Jews light five candles to represent the five lights of love in the biblical story of creation because the word light or appears five times in Genesis. And the story is often interpreted as God's first act of love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so they are lighting five candles during the 25th of Elul because light is mentioned five times at creation. And the story is often interpreted as God's first act of love. And because God loved us so much, he sent Yeshua to be our salvation. The 25th of Elul is also considered the day of creation of the universe. And some say that the 25th word of the Torah, or, which is light, may be a reference to the Hanukkah miracle. And it says, you or your spouse should light five candles that night, corresponding to the five lights of divine love, as it says, God saw the light was good in Genesis 1-4. The 25th of Elul is considered the day of creation of the universe, and some say that counting backwards five days from this date would put the first day of creation on the 25th of Elul. The image of five lights is derived from the fact that the word light, or, is mentioned five times in the biblical story of the first day of creation. This star of Jacob is going to appear 
on the very day of the 25th of Elul when they light five candles. <laughs> and there's five wise virgins that have their lights burning in the parable of the ten virgins. Even if one's life is difficult, the ultimate purpose of creation is to lead us to the state of complete peace and immortality. Light of hasading that is revealed on that day. It's very important to avoid anger. It pushes away all levels of chesed, and we lose the great potential light that appears on this day. Now, some of this material is Jewish material, so it's it's not going by the Christian narrative. It's going by the Jewish narrative, just so you understand this connection. Kabbalists suggest to light five candles toward the five times the word light is in the story of creation. And he says, I suggest reading Patak Eliyahu, Elijah opened, that comes from the opening of the Tikkunai Zohar. Tikkunai Zohar is 70 revelations of secrets revealed to the first word of the Torah in the beginning. How this is leading up to this, this is so thrilling. Five branch menorah. You may have heard of a menorah with seven branches or even nine branches. Have you ever seen or heard of a menorah with five branches? The seven branch menorah can also be known as the temple menorah. And it's the lamp or the lampstand. It has the uh, seven lights on top of it. It is the menorah that stood in the first and second temple in Jerusalem, Israel. This menorah is also recognized on Israel's coat of arms. The nine-branch menorah is most widely seen by most people, especially during Hanukkah. This menorah is called the Hanukkah, and in reality has eight candles for the eight days of Hanukkah, and a single candle sitting higher or lower than the eight, known as the servant candle, which we can see the Messiah in that. He was lifted up. And he was brought low for our sake. What about this five-branch menorah? This menorah represents the five levels of the soul, according to the Kabbalistic teaching. And they are called in ascending order, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, and Yachida. This menorah usually sits on the cantor stand in a synagogue, it is for those in their year of mourning a deceased loved one. What do the five candles mean? We light these five candles in honor of our loved ones, one for our grief, one for our courage. One, my mother gave me a necklace that had Joshua scripture on it, about in the front of it said courage on it with a, a rampant lion. One for our courage, one for our memories, one for our love, and one for our hope. And Yeshua the Messiah is our blessed hope. The first candle represents our grief. The five wise virgins lit five candles. They had the oil of the Holy Spirit in their lamps because they had the living Torah. You can have the books that are an object, but they can never give you salvation. So you don't have the oil of the Holy Spirit in you. You have the living Torah who fulfills it all because he's God, come to dwell in the flesh to remove the curse of sin and death and to take us back into a Garden of Eden-like state. Now, carrying on, in Jewish tradition, the 25th of Elul is the day that God created the world, as according in the first chapter of Genesis. Rabbi Eleazar's opinion in the Talmud is generally followed on matters related to the cosmos and astronomy, and he taught that the world was created on this day. Elul is the last month of the Jewish year and comes before Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. It's a time of introspection and personal reflection. It's a time of mercy and a month to prepare spiritually for the high holy day season of repentance and reflection. Elul is also considered a month of teshuva or forgiveness and returning to a clean state. Has returned us to a clean state. So we're purified to go meet the king. 
but those without it and just the copy, which, by the way, Moses replicated and made a copy of everything he saw. But the true is the living version, which is God himself. So isn't it interesting that this five-branch menorah has to do with remembering the dead? And could this be the very day of the resurrection of the dead and the rapture of the believers? Because day 25, Elul 25, souls collide. And they say in the Jewish books, Maimonides outlines three stages of dying. In the first stage, a person dies, but their soul survives outside of the body. At the end of days, the body will be resurrected and the soul re reunited with its body. Then after a long life in the Messianic age, they will have their second death. So you're not subjected to the second death if you've already got the Holy Spirit indwelling you, giving you eternal life. And I'm just adding that as a believer in the Messiah. In the final stage, the soul basks in the presence of the Shekinah and there lasts for all eternity. As well as this teaching, our morning and evening liturgy is inspired by Talmudic ideas of what happens in our souls while we sleep. In the evening, we recite the words of Hashkivenu, let us lie down, O Adonai, our God, in peace, and let us rise up to life, O our sovereign, to life. Spread over us your canopy of peace. And then in the morning, we awake and say the words of the Moda Ani, thanking God for the return of our souls, followed by Elohai Nimshemi Shanatatai. God, the soul you have given me is pure. There's no way our soul can be pure unless we have the fire of the Holy Spirit and his pure oil purifying our bodies. This liturgical pattern reflects conversations of the rabbis in Talmud Brakat or 57b, where it's taught that when we sleep, we experience a 60th of a death. And it's taught that during our sleep, our souls ascend to heaven to be rejuvenated and be returned to us in the morning. Not so sure about that, but with Maimonides' teaching in mind, could that mean that every night we can imagine that not only do our souls get to bask in the light of the Shekinah, the presence of God, spirituality that can be felt by humans, but also that in that ascent, we can imagine that we also get to connect with the souls of those loved ones who are no longer with us. So what I'm trying to point out by showing the Jewish version of things and then showing how it connects with the Christian version of things help, helps explain the parable of the 10 virgins. The month of Elul, which is the name given to the sixth month in God's calendar, precedes the seventh month with God's appointed times of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. The fall feast days, as they are called, denote the second coming of Messiah. The judgment and the thousand-year kingdom he is going to establish among his people, ending with a new heaven and a new earth. So it's no wonder that the month of Elul is considered a month of repentance and self-examination in the earnest waiting to meet the coming king. The word Elul is mentioned in Jewish writings to be an acronym which stands for I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine from Song of Solomon 6.3, the actual phrase being Ani Lidodi Vidodi Li. And this fits in with the picture of the bridegroom Yeshua, who weds the bride, his people, at the end of days. And this is the month of Elul, and this star of Jacob is appearing during the 25th of Elul this year. And now this connects it again to what I told you last year about the king is in the field. This month of Elul has been called the month where the king is in the field. And what did Jesus tell us about the field? He said, the field is the world. So the king comes down into the world. Is that not exciting? This denotes the fall harvest where God sends out his angels to collect the wheat into his barn and burn the tares. It also shows a picture of a king who the worker may not see every day who has come in his abundant mercy to meet the common man. 
For during the month of Elul, the king comes to the field. The king is the heart and soul of the nation, the embodiment of its goals and aspiration. The king, though sequestered behind the palace walls and bureaucracy, though glimpsed, if at all, through a veil of opulence and majesty, is a very real part of the farmer's field. He is the why of his plowing and the reason for his sowing. So we're sowing the seeds of the gospel, you guys. And this is the Jewish thought on this subject. And you will reap what you sow, the Bible says, the object of his harvest. No farmer labors for the sake of labor. He labors to transcend the dust of which he and his field are formed to make more of what is. He labors for his dreams. He labors for his king. And remember, it says that the body returns to dust from whence it came. And... Adam was created from the dust of Holy Mount Moriah, from the foundation stone. So that's where Jesus reversed the curse of death from Adam and Eve's sin of sin and death. Adam returned to dust. So this is the time in Elul that they're also talking about dust in the field. Now, what is meant by the king is in the field? The Hasidic expression, the king is in the field is often used when describing the month of Elul, a month of repentance and mercy, in which there's an extra closeness between God and his creation. Where does king in the field come from? In the Kutai Torah 5, the altar rabbi describes the tightening of the bond between God and the Jewish people in the month of Elul with the following parable. Listen to this. Just listen to this. This, if this doesn't give you the chills, I don't know what will. He says in this parable, Before a king enters his city, its inhabitants go out to greet him and receive him in the field. And the field is the world, according to Jesus. I just want to reiterate that phrase. Before a king enters his city, its inhabitants go out to greet him and receive him in the field. Compare that to the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom in the field, you guys. I mean, just let me reread that because it just blows my mind. Before a king enters his city, its inhabitants go out to greet him and receive him. In the field. And these are likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, so they went out to meet the bridegroom in the field. And now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And that's a word for, you know, death. So it's talking about the resurrection of the dead, possibly here. And at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So Elul is the period of preparing to meet the king because he's going to come suddenly. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And remember, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you will not be able to buy or sell unless you have the mark of the king. The king that they'll put it in place of King Yeshua with the Sanhedrin in Israel. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. 
A popular rabbinic teaching describes the reality of the Elul encounter as the king is in the field. The analogy is to a great king who pays a surprise visit to his subjects while they're at work in their fields. For the average man or woman, the king is inaccessible away in his palace, distant and removed. He never dreams he will actually see the king, let alone speak with him. And then suddenly, one day, and as I said before, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, while this man is bent over his menial labor in the field, so we're down here working and doing our thing, he feels a gentle tap on his shoulder. He turns around, and to his shock, it is the great king himself who's standing over him. The first man, Adam, became a living being, or a living soul. And the last Adam, the Messiah, became a life-giving spirit. And that's why you can't have eternal life unless you have the living Torah and not the copy that Moses made following the law because he fulfills all the law. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The first man was out of the earth, made of dust. So there it's mentioning dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the Messiah is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, which it mentions in the field on Elul, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, which is the Messiah. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which is die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. Suddenly... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. It actually should say the last trump. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. So if the Sanhedrin brings all the Jews under the law again, after the Messiah made one atonement for all time with his blood covenant with many, and they go under a blood covenant with many with a red heifer, which is the golden calf, which is the scarlet colored beast in the wilderness for which they sinned, to a, and it atones for the sin of a golden calf, they can never have eternal life through that. It is a covenant with death. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And now for the final piece of this puzzle. This just, I was sitting up in the lobby at the computer trying to print out some research and tears just started streaming down my face because there's this constellation called Betula. And guess what? The star of Jacob is appearing on the 25th of Elul, which is September 28th. This just blows me away where I've just, I had tears just streaming down my face. Betula is the Hebrew word for virgin. Can you imagine coming across all of this together after I've just been unveiling the mystery of 
the parable of the ten virgins with the five wise ones, with the extra virgin olive oil. So Betula is the Hebrew word for virgin, and there's a constellation named this Betula. And it is the constellation that is visible above Israel during the biblical month of Elul. And part of understanding the current appointed time and season. The letters of Elul formed that acronym that said, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And remember, the five wise virgins that had the five lit candles that are lit on Elul 25. And the people are preparing and trimming their wicks to get right with the Lord before that comes. This is directly parallel with the constellation, the Virgin, Batula, continuing the very clear theme of the month of Elul, to be prepared as the bride of Messiah Yeshua before entering. The glory cloud, the Sukkot, the temporary tent until we come back. A foreshadowing of Yeshua, the Messiah coming for his bride. So this constellation is visible over Israel, called the Virgin. At the same time, the star of Jacob is going to appear. Don't you think it's astonishing that the virgins went out and trimmed their lamps to prepare for the arrival of the bridegroom? And Elul 25 is talking about the bridegroom and the virgin? constellation and the star of Jacob and lighting the five branch menorah that has the five candles burning And they're to prepare before Rosh Hashanah and in repentance to get right with the Lord and judgment falls just after Rosh Hashanah ends. At the time of Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, it is so incredible. You guys, I was going to talk about something completely different regarding the parable of the ten virgins. And when I saw this article talking about the star of Jacob coming, appearing this next coming month, which is September 28th, Elul 25. All of this is transpiring, the lighting of the five candles. But before you get to that, what do you do? You prepare for the coming of the bridegroom, like trimming your wicks and getting ready. And then you have your candles lit on Elul 25. Oh my. Gosh, you guys. <sighs> Only the Lord could have done this. And I am so thrilled and excited and astonished that I just hope that you stay tuned and listen because the Holy Spirit is truly on the move. What are the odds that the virgin constellation is over Israel when the king is said to be in the field? In other words, he descends from heaven suddenly and is suddenly tapping you on the shoulder saying, I'm here, it's time to go. And those who were ready to meet the bridegroom that had the five candles lit, which happens on Elul 25, they went in through the door with the bridegroom, but the others did not. And like I said, it's like Noah entered the ark and everybody that was in the ark and God shut the door this is exactly what's happening here. God shuts the door. The bridegroom comes for his bride, takes her 
through the door, the door is shut, and then those who don't have the Holy Spirit anointing in their lamps, in their vessel of their body that purified them to have eternal life, they will perish outside, left behind. So this is incredible. You should have the chills over and over because this star of Jacob hasn't appeared in over 2,000 years. And Elul 25, September 28th, that's when the candles are lit of the five-branch menorah, five wise virgins. Like I said, be one of the wise ones and not one of the fools. You don't want to be left outside when the bridegroom closes the door. Oh, man. Guys, wasn't this worth waiting for? It's so exciting. I hope that I said it very clear. I had interruptions, and here I am trying to finish it up. I just pray that this is the year. Wouldn't that be exciting? But this is true information. This is not conjured up. These are details and piecing it all together. But finding this five-branch menorah is the five wise virgins that had their, they had trimmed their lamps in the whole month of Elul is about preparing to meet the king who comes down to meet his servants in the field. He's closer than ever because he descends from his palace and comes here and he suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, right there to take you to be with him. Hallelujah! Woo! Here we go. This is something to look forward to. We don't know what year. We don't know when exactly. But these are just pieces of a puzzle that just interlocked. These are chunks of information that I've talked about. The king is in the field before. But all of this comes together with the virgin constellation on that day at the time of the star of Jacob showing up. <laughs> Oh, the Lord is opening the eyes of the blind to see his glory and his majesty is coming. Woo, prepare, prepare. The king is coming. Trim your lamps and get ready. And light those candles, guys, because our light shines through his light. God bless. I'll see you in the next video. I hope it was worth waiting for. See you later. And, you know, all of this wasn't readily, um, you know, connected or anything. It was just, I was sitting at the computer printing out information and one thing led to another. And I had tears streaming down my face when I saw this whole connection. Some parts of it, of course, we've already talked about. But the five-branch menorah being lit on that night at the time the star appears in the sky after 2,000 years is stunning being the five lamps of the five wise virgins. Woo! Couldn't get any more exciting, don't you think? Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for waiting for the video. And I'll see you in the next episode. Shalom for now. God bless.